Hello, this is James with First Updates Now. I'm here with Team 386 from Melbourne, Florida at the beautiful Orlando Regional. They're going to be going over their very unique, uh, their very unique intake design, including a very, a very cool wrist actuation. And we're going to be going over some of their vision stuff as well. This video on First Updates Now is made possible by viewers like you and also the following sponsors. Kettering University is looking for talented robotic students who want to continue learning and innovating in a hands-on real-world experience format. Kettering University representatives will be at dozens of FIRST events this season, including the championship. Go to kettering.edu slash FIRST to see which events you can meet a Kettering University representative. FRC competition season is here. Submit your favorite moments to FRC Clips of the Week by each Sunday at discord.gg slash first updates now. Also, the FRC Top 25 poll is open Sunday, 5 p.m. Eastern to Monday, 5 p.m. Eastern, where you can vote for your top 25 teams of the week at firstupdatesnow.com slash FRC Top 25. All right, starting us off, Gabe, you're going to be going over your guys' drivetrain, right? For our drivetrain, we use SDS Mark IV Inverted, and we just do a field-oriented swerve. On our driver controller, we let we have a trigger to go into robot-oriented mode to drive off the camera. And we also have a button to offset our center of rotation for the swerve to the right, to the front bumper, in order to swerve around defending robots. So you guys are using a swerve drive. There's a lot of debate in the community right now about whether you do field-centric or robot-centric swerve drive. Which one did you guys go with, and what was the reasoning behind that decision? For our general driving, we'd use field-oriented so that the driver can have a good awareness of the field while controlling the robot. And then for finer driving and using the camera, we toggle to robot-oriented mode. All right, and Matt, you're going to be going over the, the intake and the rest, right? Yep. All right, so this year we went for a grabber mechanism. It is all in one, so we do both cubes and cones. So when we go into our intake, we move our arm out, and it, re it rests right about here. This is going to be in our cube mode, so we, just, uh, we have two Neos on either side to run <clears throat> our intake mechanism. Uh, when we go into cone mode, we have a pneumatic actuator in here that will close it. So in this mode, we have uh, this allows us to pick up cubes that are standing upright. Um, we actually limit the pressure in the pneumatic cylinder so to allow it to have a little bit of compliance. And then when we want to ro pick up a, a cone that's flipped over, we actually rotate our wrist with a motor back here and a 3D printed bearing uh, block right here. And this allows us to pick up cones that are on their side, which uh, we found a really big advantage because a lot of teams aren't able to do that. So when, when a cone's on its side, either they're having to shuffle them to their hybrid zone or they're just leaving them alone. So it allows us to get pieces that other people can't. So you said that this whole wrist thing is a, is a 3D printed part. Did you guys do that with an in-house thing? Did you outsource? Like what was the design process behind the wrist itself? Yeah, so uh, most most of our robot is done in-house. So 3D, this was all 3D printed. This year we actually did get a water jet. So plates like this and this were water jet out. So we were, not, uh, we were able to uh, not only save weight, but also get really precise uh, plates um, that we can, so we have a good f uh, feel for what we're doing. All right, Lil, you were going to go over the arm mechanism itself, right? Yeah. So our arm is, um, we wanted to go for something lightweight, so we had an, uh, an alumnus that has, that has an auto body shop, and has, so we had access to a plasma cutter. I can grab one of the pieces. So this is a part of the arm that was plasma cut by the alumnus in the auto body shop. So we wanted to make it really lightweight um, to make sure that we didn't go over the weight limit or had to restrict other things because of the arm weight. So we, it's very light. Um, we also have access to a water jet at our school now, which is, we're very fortunate for that. And we had these plates right here Not were cut by the water jet is currently about to start. We're queuing at our for school. 78. So on our arm, we have two joints. It's a double jointed arm. We have the shoulder joint and the elbow joint. So we have magnetic limits on um, the shoulder. So that's to make sure it doesn't go too high or too low at any point in time. So it doesn't break itself or the robot or anybody else's robot. We also have med magnetic limits on the wrist. So we use chains and these really strong turnbuckles to help move the arm. Uh, originally, we were going to use belts instead of chains, but we 
but we changed that I we changed that thought because they were going to break easily and change our much more durable. So we use these really strong turnbuckles. Um, we do have let's see. We do have, this is one of the older turnbuckles. Um, this one isn't the one that broke, but there was one that broke. It was, I think it held about 40 pounds. And we tried to use that and something happened where it snapped. So then we decided that we needed to use stronger turnbuckles and more supported chains. So we switched to chains and the stronger turnbuckles. With an arm, with an arm this big, and and it is a it is a large mechanism this year. What did you guys do in order to guarantee that you wouldn't be too top heavy or risk tipping in terms of designing all the structure going above the arm? Um, so we put quite a bit of our weight down low. We tried to we tried to have more things down low than up high. Um, so and that's also why we made um, the structure of the arm. Um, hollow and really lightweight like that just to make sure we weren't wh too top heavy so it didn't tip over all right we're going to go back to gabe real quick and he's going to go over some of their software decisions in terms of vision tracking and other stuff so for our software we wanted to balance giving the manipulator a lot of control as well as automating a lot of the process to make it faster so for our arm we stored all the positions we would and positions we'd want the arm to be in as keyframes so we have a pickup a slightly lower pickup for cones on the side, a medium score for cubes, a medium score for cones, as well as high scores for both pieces. And we store the state that the arm is in and the key frame that we want to go to next. And, the and then we use, um, and then we generate the path that we want to to get from where we are now to where we need to be. And Again, we use 13, 6, PID controls with absolute encoders on both of our joints in order to make sure that we're getting the arm to the right place. And so for our manipulator, is able to store the position he wants to place, such as cone high, and then there's just one button to score and the arm will move completely there to score. And we have these LEDs on the side that keep track of by reading the state that the arm is in to either be blue for cube or yellow for cone, which lets us communicate with the human players which piece to give us. All right, this is a very cool and unique robot. And for this year's very specific game, I do have two questions for you guys. The first question is, how do you guys feel about charge up? Voltage! And the most important question is, which way is the beach? That way! This is James signing off with Team 386 from Melbourne, Florida. Thank you so much, Gabe, Matt, and Lily. And we're hoping to see you guys perform well both today and at the Tallahassee Regional next week. Yeah. This video on First Updates Now is made possible by viewers like you and also the following sponsors. Kettering University is looking for talented robotics students who want to continue learning and innovating in a hands-on real-world experience format. Kettering University representatives will be at dozens of FIRST events this season, including the championship. Go to kettering.edu slash FIRST to see which events you can meet a Kettering University representative. FRC competition season is here. Submit your favorite moments to FRC Clips of the Week by each Sunday at discord.gg slash first updates now. Also, the FRC Top 25 poll is open Sunday, 5 p.m. Eastern to Monday, 5 p.m. Eastern, where you can vote for your top 25 teams of the week at firstupdatesnow.com slash FRC Top 25. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay up to date on our new videos. Keep the conversation going and provide your input to our content. Watch our live shows at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Join our Discord at discord.gg forward slash first updates now and check out Fun FTC on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and First Updates Now on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter.